Father, there's no other name like yours. There's nobody else like you, Lord. We acknowledge that this morning. And we praise you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, church. Once again, my name is Luis Peralta. And it's such a blessing for me to be in this place worshiping Christ with all of you. Something incredible, something amazing, it's something unique about that name. Something that goes beyond race, language, color of the skin, color of the eyes, something that goes beyond of that. And that's his name. Amen? Amen. Greetings from our church in Mexico City. They all want to be here with me and worship with you, but that's not something not possible, at least not at this time. But say, uh, receive the greetings from our church and the thank you and the gratitude for everything that you have done to help us, all the work that you have done to come alongside of us, to spread the word of God and to be part of the way that God is establishing his kingdom in Mexico and the way that Jesus is edifying his church. So thank you for that. Super. Enough of ourselves. We hear about a lot about what God is doing in Mexico through Moses' uh, and through our lives. And let's open the word. Amen. Let's go over. We're going to be on Exodus 33. Exodus 33. And Exodus 33 talks about his presence in our life. It's all about his presence in our life. So when you have it, say amen. amen. Exodus 33. But in the meantime, just let me give you a little bit of background. And myself first. <laughs> I'm originally from Guatemala. I've been serving in Mexico for the last uh, three years. And it's been uh, such a ride. It's been a blessing to watch how God has been working, especially in my life and the life of my wife. Because uh, he's been changing our lives in a, in a way that, that I, we never thought it was possible. And he's been putting our love in, in our hearts for Mexico and, and for, uh, for his people. And the work that he's been doing goes beyond what we ever, never, ever could imagine. We, get, we went down with something in our hearts and something in our minds and an idea that God, God can do miracles. But the way he's been working goes beyond our own imagination. And I'm sure that he's been doing the same thing here in this side of Houston. And just because he is God, not because of us but because of him, because of it's all about him. It's nothing about us. It's all about him. We have nothing to do with that. It's just about him. And that's something that we as a church, we need to have clear in our minds and in our hearts. Everything that he does is because of himself, because he's worthy of that, and because he wants to be known around the world with, in every tribe and every tongue. So let's keep that in our minds and our hearts clearly. It's not about us. It's not about you, George. It's not about me. It's about him. Amen? Amen? Why I'm saying this is because sometimes what is in our heart, what is in the man's heart? What is in your heart? It's more likely to think, oh, but by this time, probably Moses is gone. Probably God's, Moses is died. He's dead already. So you need to do something for us, Aaron. You need to, you know what, you need to build us a God so, we can, so he can lead us to the promised land. And we know God promised something for us. We know God is with us. We know, we remember God brought us out of Egypt. We know that God brought us out of a slavery that we were. We were crying for so long, for freedom. And yeah, God sent Moses and God take us away, bring us out from Egypt. But at this point, all that is history. And because... It's all about us. You need to do something, Aaron. And that's what was going on down there. And you know why it's so easy for us as his church to forget everything that he has done and to start thinking about ourselves. And all the pressure come to Aaron. Do something for us, Aaron. Do something for us. And you know the story. Aaron asked for all this gold. And he built a calf. 
So that's, that's what was going on at the moment. And they forget about God and his presence in their life. And Aaron make a common mistake. And I say common mistake because that's, that's what happened to so many of us so often. We forgot about God and his presence and the work that he has done in our life. And we start thinking about the people. What the, th- the people going to think about me? What the people going to think about us? Oh, I need to please people. And with uh, uh, conscious of it or without of it, we try to please people. We start doing things to make people happy. And we forget about God. That's just, that happened to me? That happened to you guys? It's like, oh, yeah, I know God is asking me this, but if I go this direction, people's going to hate me. And that happened at work, that happens at school, that happened even inside of a church. We just try to be people pleasers. And that happens to Aaron. Aaron knew who God was. Aaron knew what was going on in the mountain between God and Moses. But he get to the point that, hmm, people are going to come after me. They will hate me. I need to do something about it. And I know how. And they're asking for a God. Oh, that's easy. I can do something. Bring all the gold. Bring all the gold. And family, church, we need to be very careful. We must go after God's presence in every single thing that we do. When, with this or with that, am I pleasing God or am I trying to please others or myself? Am I seeking God's presence in my life? Am I giving glory to God with the way I'm acting, the way I'm talking, the way I'm working, the way I'm going to school? And every single thing, it's about God's presence in our life. And you know why? Because God's presence, that's what makes the difference in us. His presence, that's the difference. That's what makes us different. That's what makes me different. That's what makes you different. It's God's presence and nothing else. It's God's presence in our life that makes the difference, that makes us so attractive. That was the early church had. And they were growing in grace with God and among the people because God's presence was among them. And that's something that we must seek. The whole chapter 33 is about Moses praying and asking God's presence. He knew that without God's presence, he was nothing. And the people of Israel will become like any other nation. We need his presence, church. We need his presence. Because his presence, first of all, confronted my sin, confronted us with our sin. You got chapter 33? Let's go to verse 4. Got it? When the people hear this disastrous word, they mourn, and no one put on his ornaments. Verse 5, for the Lord has said to Moses, said to the people of Israel, you are a stiff-necked people. And if for a single moment I should go up among you, I will consume you. So now take off your ornaments that I may know what to do with you. Verse 6, therefore the people of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb, Horeb onward. What was the devastating news? There was so disastrous news. What was those news? If you go back to verse 1, the Lord says to Moses, Depart, go up from here. You and the people whom you have brought up of the land of Egypt, to the land of which I, I swear to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your offspring I will give it. And I will send an angel before you. And I will drive out the Canaanites and the Amorites, that all those weird names. They are so hard for me to pronounce in English. (laughs) Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey. And here's the part, the devastating news for Israel and for Moses. But are are you with me there? Underline that in your Bible if you like. But I will not go up among you. 
You will go. Take the people. Go away. I will send an angel in front of you. I'm not going with you. That was like, can you imagine that? And sometimes we live our lives. And God is not guiding us. Some other things, our own desires, our own dreams, our own interests are guiding our lives. But I will not go up among you lest I consume you on the way. Why? What your Bible says. Help me out. You're a stiff-necked people. You don't get it. You don't understand what this is all about. Come on, people. You don't get it. That's what God is telling Moses. <laughs> so when the people hear all this, this disastrous news, the devastating news that was not even I will destroy you. The devastating news was I will not go up among you. That hit them. And it's, you know, call my attention that in the first five verses, God called his people twice. Stephen X people. You see it? He wants to make sure, like, you don't get it, people. You don't understand what is going on here. You don't understand your purpose. You don't understand why I chose you. Why I put my eyes on you. So when the people hear that, they mourn. That's what verse 4 says. And they, no one, and, and no one put on his ornaments. They mourn. What it means mourn? They were expressing sorrow of grief, repentance. They're like, oh, what we have done. There was grief among them. And there's two kinds of grief based on uh, 2 Corinthians 10. You know that, right? This is a godly grief that produces repentance, and this repentance produces life. But also there's this world of grief that doesn't produce repentance. It just produces death. Let me put it this way. God, I have sinned against you. And your spirit on me confronted with my sin. Your presence is confronted my sin. Nobody else knows. You know. So I'm getting to the point, God, to the place, God, that I need to come clean to you and ask for forgiveness. Please forgive me, God. But the other kind of repentance is like, oh, they cut me. They cut me. There's not, I have to accept it. And that usually just make us. Make our heart hard. If they should have cut me, oh, I will keep going with this the rest of my life. But they cut me. But the kind of repentance that God is expecting from all of us is that sorrow. It's like, ah, oh, I have sinned against you. Please, God, forgive me. That's what was going on here. When they hear this devastating news, the people are like, oh, we, Moses was like, no, God, we cannot go on without your presence among us. We cannot go on without your presence in our midst. So please, God, forgive us. And then it says that the people, that no one put on his ornaments. What is an ornament? Is an article is something that you put on to make yourself look better? To look pretty, like this morning, I was like, okay, let me see. Am I looking nice? Am I looking good? Am I looking slim? Let me see. <laughs> <laughs> After all we've been eating, Pastor Moses, <laughs> we gain a few extra pounds. <laughs> Something that we don't need. But you know. People take away, remove all the ornaments. When the people of Israel were confronted with their sin, with the reality, with the consequences that they had to face, they removed, they stopped putting on all the ornaments. They stopped giving excuses. They take away the self righteousness. They take away all like, oh, my God, I did this, I did that. 
And we as a church, sometimes we, you know, add all these ornaments to ourselves. Oh, we are so worthy. We're so good looking. I've been doing this. I've been serving here. I've been serving there. It's about time that we need to be clean with God. We need to take away all the ornaments, all the safe righteousness that we may have or think we have. That's what they were doing here. How do we react when we are confronted with our sin? How do you react when the Spirit of God that abides in you confronted you with your sin? Do we give excuses? The woman you gave me, Lord, the serpent. So at the end, God, it's your fault. I didn't want to steal that, God, but it was so easy and you put it in front of me. So I couldn't resist. I didn't want to lie, God, but we just, you know, why lie? How do we react when we're confronted with our sin? Are we thinking about his presence in us? And the difference that that will that you make in our lives? Or are we taking Aaron's position and making excuses for what we do? Are we blaming somebody else? <laughs> are we looking for his presence, George? Do we desire his presence? Or are we just living our lives like, eh, who cares? Came to church, check. Going to small group, check. Serve once a month in children ministry, check. Or are we going after his presence? Because at the end of the day, what it makes the difference in us is his presence. You were hearing a few testimonies from Harvest Norte in Mexico City. Why you have done to this lady? We knew that she was going to this church, but she was a mess. Now he's coming to hear something happened. And you know what? That's nothing that Moses did or the, or the place did. It was just God's presence. That's what makes it different. That's what makes the difference in the early church. What these people have? I want to have that. That was God working in people's life. And you know, if we want to have that, if, we want to God, if, we, if you want to have God's presence in your life, in your family, is your, is your neighbor seeing a difference in your life? Is my wife seeing a difference in me because I'm going after God's presence? Are my kids watching a difference in my life because God's presence is being show up in, my, in me or not? It's not about how good we are because we are bad and our heart is evil. It's about God's presence. It's all about him in our lives. And I find out, and this probably be helpful to you, but if I want God's presence to be manifested in my life, and if I want the God's presence in my life to show a difference, the first thing that I need to do is start taking responsibility for my sins. And start blaming somebody else. Oh, the culture. Oh, I was raised this way. Oh, pastor, you don't know my parents. The way they treat me, make me act this way. Oh, pastor, you don't know the pressure that I have at school. It's about time to stop making excuses and taking responsibility of our sin and coming clean to, the, to God. Hmm. You know, something that when I was going through this passage, something that at the beginning made me laugh, but then end up crying, was the silly excuse that Aaron gave when he was confronted. What you have done, Aaron? I don't know. The people give me this goal, I throw it into the fire, and this idol came out. Really? And I started laughing, but then I have to go back to my knees. <laughs> I see myself in Aaron. 
I didn't want to, God, but, but at the end, it's not my fault. It's about time, church, that we need to, that we need to come clean with God. Jesus told us in John 16 that his Holy Spirit dwells in us. And that his spirit, the one that is, uh, is going to convict us of righteousness and judgment. Moses and Israel, God was abiding among them. But in our days, today, the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, abide in us. Not, not, not in us. And that's his spirit that confronted us with judgment, with righteousness. How are we doing in that line, church? Oh, I want to tell you that God loves you and God has an incredible plan for you. And that is true. But it's more than that. God wants to have that very cold relationship with each one of us. And the only way that that's going to happen is going after his presence in our life. Moving forward in the sanctification process. We all have sin. But we have one that intercedes for us with the Father. And that's Jesus Christ, his son. So when was the last time that you came clean to God, in front of God? When was the last time that you said to God, God, here I am. You know me. You know my thoughts even before they come out. And I have sinned against you, Lord. This, this, this. Those sins that are so obvious and the others that are hidden. And I don't want to miss this opportunity. Let's take a chance. Let's take, let's take advantage of this opportunity. I don't know your life. I know my life. And I know sometimes between home and church, many, many, many things can happen. That's probably happened only to me. <laughs> but I know I, need to, I, need, I have the need to come clean with God. So why don't we take a minute right where you are and come clean with God? Just close your eyes. Keep seat. You want to stand, you want to kneel. At the end, that doesn't matter. We're going to tomar un momento. Y alineas tu vida con Dios. Bueno, tomas un momento y le dices, Dios, reconozco que he pecado contra el cielo y he pecado contra ti. Por favor, perdona mis pecados, límpiame. Te necesito, Dios. Father, we acknowledge, Lord, that we have sinned against you. Father, and we can make up many excuses why. But at the end of the day, I have sinned. Father, would you, would you cleanse me of my sins, Lord? Will I repent of my sins. I just want to be clean with you. I need your presence, Lord, in my life. In Jesus' name, Father. Amen. We need his presence. Because his presence confronts my sin. We need his presence. Because his presence opens a door for communication. You know, his presence opens that door to go, to go back and forth. Go with me to verse 9. When Moses entered the tent... The pillar of cloud will descend and stand at the entrance of the tent. And the Lord will speak with Moses. Wow. The pillar of cloud. 
If you go back in your Bible later on and you read Exodus chapter 13, you will see there was, there was a cloud during the day, there was a pillar of fire during the night, and that was uh, for Israel to remember God's presence was with them, God's presence was leading them. And here, when Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud was, will descend and stand at the entrance of the tent. And here's the amazing thing. The Lord will speak with Moses. Wow. We need his presence. We need to hear his voice. We need that. And you know, first Moses, there were some things that Moses was doing here. First, Moses move away of anything that could interrupt that communication. So, like, I need to take everything away. Any, no interruptions. Nothing can stand between this time and this, between God and myself. I need to move away. So, Moses was moving away. And, you know, one of the things that I believe Moses did that is because Moses was aware that to whom he, was will, he will be talking to. Nothing can be between God and myself. Nothing can interrupt that. It's just between him and me. I need to move away. I need to move aside. So we need to have a tent in the, at the end of our backyard? That's what it is? No. But at a certain point, you need to take away anything that may distract that time between you and God. It's like cell phones, email, whatever it is. Honey, wait for me over here. I remember when I wasn't a believer, my stepfather, he was the first person to receive Christ in our family. And I wasn't such a good kid. <laughs> and I noticed that around 3 a.m., there was four of us, four, four, uh, my, my siblings, and I noticed that around 3 a.m., he used to get in. We live in a small apartment in Guatemala. That's my home country. And he used to get into the bathroom around 3 a.m. I noticed that a couple of times, and I was like, what's going on here? So one morning, I went after him. I was 17 years old. And I started hearing. And that was the place. That was the only place that he can find, that he can move away from everything. And I can hear him praying. I can hear him calling out to God for the rest of the family. He was, a, he was willing to wake up early, early, early in the morning before all of us wake up and start bothering and running around like crazy. So sometimes we need to do, we need, we need to find that place where away from everything. Second thing that Moses did is that he started leading his people by example. And everyone, verse 7, now Moses used to take the tent out and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And then everyone who saw the Lord will go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, verse 8, all the people will rise up and each will stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. Moses was leading his people by example. I like to tell the leaders of my church, the speed of the leader, the speed of the team, the speed of the father, the speed of the family, the speed of the husband, the speed of the wife. We need to start leading by example. Guys, are we leading by example? Are we taking away any distraction and going after God's presence every day? Because if not, they want to have to start a Bible counseling ministry or something if they don't have it yet. <laughs> because even doing that is not easy. I don't know how can we manage without it. But we need to start leading by example. Why? Because your family is a reflection of you. And if you're a single mom, same thing. Same responsibility. Are you leading by example? And if you're the oldest brother in the family, you have a responsibility. You need to lead those who are watching you, those who are younger than you. They're watching you. We need to lead by example. And that's what Moses was doing here. 
He was leading and people noticed that and started watching him and going after that. Standing at the tent. What's going on? And they saw how the pillar of cloud was descending and they knew there was something going on between God and Moses. And then the most amazing thing happened. Verse 9. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud will descend and stand at the entrance of the tent. And the Lord will speak with Moses. What? The Lord will speak with Moses. I'm going to take away any distraction. I'm going to go find my place. I'm going to talk to God. And then when I open the word, God will speak to me. God will speak to you the same way that he will talk to Moses. <laughs> and let me tell you this. The secret wasn't in the place. The secret wasn't in the person. So it's not about the place. It's not about the pastor. It's not about even the priest. It's not about nothing like that. It's about God himself. When we go after him, when we go after his presence, when we cry out to him, he hears and he answers. If we seek God, he will show himself to us. Verse 11. Does the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man who speak to his friends? Wow. Can you imagine that? The God of universe, the creator of everything, the almighty God was talking with Moses face to face. You want to hear something more incredible than that? God himself is abiding in you. Wow. That blows my mind. I still not get it. I'm still trying to understand that kind of love and that kind of relationship that God wants to have with us. The God himself came flesh, died for us on the cross. He went to the tomb. He rose. Now he's sitting in the right hand of God. He's abiding in me. And he's willing to talk to me, to speak to me, to speak to you. That's amazing. That's more than enough reason to be going after his presence every single moment in our life. God, I want to see you. I want to speak to you. I want to hear you. Wow. Psalm 51, 7 says that the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart he will not dismiss. That's the secret. Am I recognizing, acknowledging my need of his presence in my life? It's not about me. It's about you, Lord. It's about you, Lord. I need your presence in my life. Because your presence will confront my sin. Because your presence will open a door of communication, direct communication. We don't, we don't need to go through anybody else. Oh, Pastor, can you pray for me? Because God hears you. I hear that so many times. And sometimes I may sound a little bit harsh. Because my answer is, why are you waiting to repent? So he can hear you too. It's not about us. It's about his presence in our life. It's about to go to the tent. It's about time to go away from everything that distracts us from his presence. It's about time to start thinking of what going to happen. And I said this, and, I, and I'm not saying that thinking about our future is not important. But at the same time, we have spent so much time working, trying to make a living, trying to earn money. Because we're always going to need a bigger house. We're always going to need a second, third, fourth car. We're always going to have to renew 
the all that we have. And we are so consumed by all those things that we forget about the important thing. A hundred years from now, who care who Luis was? Who care who Moses was? Who care who Pastor John Cunningham was? A hundred years if Jesus Christ hasn't come? Who cares about that? And what if Jesus comes today? Oh, please, Lord, come today. It would be amazing, don't you think? Boom. Everything is gone. By the way, I can give you the address of my house if you don't know Jesus in Mexico so you can go back and get it. I don't need it. We need his presence because his presence gives me rest. Verse 14. This communication going on back and forth between God and Moses. And he's, he said, God is telling Moses, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Wow, what a promise. Do you see it there? My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. My presence will go with you. But it's amazing, that's a reality as believers. If you have received Christ as your personal Savior, that's your reality. His presence is with you. But if you haven't received Christ as your personal Savior, sorry to say that, but his presence is not with you. But at the same time, you're not empty. So if God's presence is not with you, whose presence is in you then? That's homework. And the only way that we can have God's presence in our life is when we surrender ourselves to him. Ask for his forgiveness. And receive his sacrifice on the cross for us. His grace. His salvation. The gift of salvation. My presence will go with you. <laughs> and then the promise. And I will give you rest. If my presence is with you, you will have rest. But the word rest here implies peace in the midst of struggles. Peace in the midst of war. Peace. God's peace. In the midst of all these trials. The promise from God to Moses was, I will be with you. And my presence will give you rest. And notice this. He did not say, I, my presence will be with you and I will change all this stiff neck people. My presence will be with you and you will have no problems. My presence be, will be with you and you will be poor no more. My presence be, will, will be with you and you will be healed forever. He did not say that. My presence will be with you, and you will have rest. His peace in the midst of all the trials. His peace in the midst of all the difficulties that we face. Hmm. Are we finding rest in God's presence, church? Where do you find your rest? Where do you find your peace? Where? In your bank account? In your 401k? <laughs> in alcohol? Drugs? Porn? Where do you run when you need his peace? Where do you go when, do you, when you need his rest? Pastor, are you talking to the church? Yes, I know. Guilty of that. So many times my heart is in trouble. And instead of going towards God and his word, I start going, running after my knowledge, my experience. Oh, I know how can we handle this. Oh, I know. If I do A, B, C, I will get to D. And guess what? At the end of the day, <laughs> the last thing that I found is rest and is peace. At the end of the day, I get deeper and deeper and deeper in my troubles. 
Are we finding rest in God's presence, church? Because that's the place we need to run. Why? Because we need his presence. You know what? We need his presence because his presence will reaffirm my convictions. Verse 15. And he said to him, now is Moses' time to reply. He said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. I don't want to move away from here. Your presence is not coming with us. If your presence is not with me, I'm not moving. I'm staying here. That's a conviction. That's a conviction. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight and I and your people? It is not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people in the face of the earth. It's his presence. He has that conviction. The only thing that is going to make us different is your presence, God. And we're not moving without you. I know that you're offering, a, offering us an angel. Thank you, angel, but you're not enough. We need your presence, God. We need you, nothing else. We need you, God. Nothing else will take your place. Nothing else will satisfy. Nothing else is you, you, your presence. And we as a church, we need to go back to that. We're struggling as a church worldwide with all these crazy movements. So glad that you're not trying to keep Austin, I mean, Houston weird. As Austin is, they're trying to keep Austin weird. But in all, I mean, all this weirdness that is going on around us, we need his presence more than ever before. We need it. We need it without his presence, which is going to become like anybody else. Well, with the Bible in our hands. But it's his presence that we need. His presence will reaffirm our conviction. Moses' conviction was strong. I almost sure that one thing that he that Moses didn't have was peace in his heart with everything that was going on. But he was asking for his presence. He was asking for his presence. Because his presence will reaffirm his convictions. His presence in our life will reaffirm our convictions. Why is, is that important? Because our decisions, the way we live, the way we act, the decisions we make, this is showing off where your convictions are. Any simple decision that we may take shows up, like it or not, our, where our convictions are. You probably hear this. Oh, I don't have peace in my heart, so this is probably not from God. Really? Oh, I have peace in my, ha- in my heart to do this, so this must be God then. Really? I don't think Jesus was having peace in his heart when he was, Father, can you pass this cup from me? But it, because it's not about me, Father, do as you please. A year and a half ago, a pulmonologist told me in, back in Chicago, Luis, Mexico City is killing your wife. As soon as we land in Mexico, probably a week or two weeks after, because of all the pollution, my wife develops respiratory issues. She was having a hard time breathing. She was coughing without stopping for almost a year and a half. And when I was finally was able to bring her over to Chicago to be seen by a doctor, that's what the doctor told me. Mexico City is killing your wife. You need to take her away from Mexico City. My first reaction was, yes, okay, okay, let's do that. Let's start packing our things. Let's start closing everything. Let's give the church to somebody else and go back. Go away from Mexico City. When we are led by our feelings, by what we think, or if we have peace or not, that's going to take us to the wrong place. That happens to me. But by God's grace, 
during that process, the conviction hit us, both of us. Why we came to Mexico? Are we sure God sent us? Yes. Are we sure God is in control of everything? Yes. Can he have the power to heal? Yes. So what we need to do? Talking with my wife. As a wisely wife and a beautiful helper. Like, Luis, we need to go back to our knees. <laughs> and start crying out. We need, to, we need to go back to the tent of meeting. <laughs> we need to go back to God's presence. So we went back and started praying. And it's just amazing how God works. After that moment of praying, of becoming in front of God's presence, saying, God, I know that you send us here, and I know you don't make mistakes, so I don't get it. But we're not moving. We're not moving. The health, my wife's health started improving. She's still in the process. She's still in that. But God has been showing himself faithful. Our decisions will show up, our convictions. And finally, we need his presence because, and that's a beautiful thing, his presence allows me to experience his grace. Even though I was thinking I'll start packing and moving away, he did not count that against me. His grace was enough. And he embraced me. He's helping us to go through all that. Verse 17. And the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken. Wow. <laughs> it's not amazing. Are you following the reading? This very thing that you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight. And I know you by name. Church, he knows you by name. He knows you by name. And when we start... When we start going after his presence, his presence in our life will allow us to experience his grace. We deserve hell. And because of his grace, he went a prepared place for us to be with him. I don't know how can we live not going after him after what he has done for us. His presence, his presence in our life. When we seek his presence, we find his grace. You have found favor. And the word favor in the original uh, Hebrew means gracious, please, pleasant, precious, well favored. In other words, you know what God is telling Moses? I will do what you ask, Moses, because you are so precious to me. That's what God is telling this church this morning. If you go after my presence, I will answer. Not for silly things, for the eternal things. Because, church, you are so precious to me. I give my son for you. You are so precious to me. That's what God is telling Moses. So, church, everything begins and ends with God's presence. At the end of the book, God's presence is there. And his presence is lighting up the whole city. There's no need for sun. There's no need for stars. There's no need. His presence is there. At the beginning was nothing but his presence. So God have mercy on us when we think that we are good enough or self-sufficient. To keep moving alongside without his presence. It's not about a building. It's not about a church name. It's not about a pastor. It's not about a leader. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's all about him. It's all about his presence in our lives. 
I want to be used by God. Are you? Let's go after his presence. Without his presence in our life, we're not different than anybody else. And that's by his grace. <laughs> not for our good deeds. It's by his grace. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your presence in our life. Thank you for the way that you have promised and you fulfill the promise that you will abide in us. Thank you because your spirit abiding in us will convict us from sin, will open the door for communication. Father, we'll reaffirm our conviction. And because of your presence, we are allowed to experience your grace. Father, help us not to forget that. Help us to always remember that it's all about you, Lord. Help us as your church to shine bright for you, Lord. So people can see us and they can see you in us. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name, Father, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together.